Hello, crew. Captain Foley and Commander Cockings are back for another great Trek Yards episode. Did you miss us? We certainly hope not, <laughs> as you do get to see us every week after all. Okay, so today's episode is one that was requested by Aaron B. Walsh, one of our Indiegogo supporters. So in effect, this episode of Trek Yards is sponsored by Aaron Walsh. Thanks for your support, Aaron. <laughs> he donated for a pick-your-own-ship perk, and as such, got to pick the topic of today's discussion. That being the Little Scene Saber class starship, first seen on screen in the Battle of Sector 001 at the beginning of Star Trek First Contact. Now, this is indeed a cool little ship, and we are happy to present that to you now. But please be aware that there is a ton of conflicting information on this ship, and we have done our best to bring it to you all in one cohesive episode and present it in a way that makes sense and will let you decide which you feel is appropriate. We hope you appreciate how difficult it can be to acquire much of this information from multiple sources and make it an entertaining and enjoyable Trek Yards episode. So with all that being said, and without further delay, we bring you the Saber Class. Yeah. Absolutely, and thank you again for your support, Aaron. So, on to the show. Yeah, this is a really cool little ship. However, its size is a little suspect. Uh, depending on what source you look at, it's different. <laughs> Memory Alpha states it's 190.5 meters long. However, the DS9 technical manual lists its length at 364 meters, which is obviously a big difference. Uh, this could be possibly confused with the Norway class, though, as they show the exact same dimensions, so possibly a publishing error. Hmm. Uh, then there is the ILM, which is the Industrial Light and Magic, which is you know the VFX company that did the effects for the film. Their size, their internal size chart, says this ship is 223 meters in length. However, the visual effects supervisor for the film, David Stripes, has said that actually the length is 190.5. So, um... This is a tough one. Oh, yeah, and as you can see on the screen next to us, those sizes present us with quite a decision. Yeah. So it is a tough one, but it's generally agreed that the, the size used on screen was 190.5, and that came up a lot in my research, more so than the others. So I'm, I'm kind of accepting either the 223, uh, which is the initial size chart, or the 190. So it's kind of up to you. I'm probably going to go with the 190. So not as big as the Norway, then? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, so I think for me, it's best to go with the visual effects supervisor. Uh, internal size charts for these films, I mean, we might just have the one that's out of date or the other one might not have been published. So I think it's best to go with the supervisor because, you know, they oversee the whole production. So they had the best idea of what's going on. So I'm going to go with 190.5, making the ship only 73 metres longer than the Defiant, which is a, a tough little ship, um, and about the same size as the Nova class, which is 181 metres. Hmm. Hmm. Now, it's also not 100% agreed upon how the class name Sabre is spelt, as both the American S-A-B-E-R and the British S-A-B-R-E. So we're saying the S-A-B-R-E is right, because British. American design ship for an American show, the general acceptance of the spelling is B-E-R. So... Fine. Just putting it out there. Uh, <laughs> they're both used depending upon the source material, so we will leave that to your decision and your own personal preference. One thing that all the sources do agree upon, however, is that the crew complement is about 40 to 60, with a 200 personnel evacuation limit mm. and 8 to 10 decks, again, depending on the source material. Hmm. Uh, so compare to the Defiant, which has 50 crew and only 4 decks. And then compare that again to the you know ship of relative size, the Nova class, which has a crew of eighty and eight decks. So this sounds about right in terms of you know comparable size. Indeed. Uh, so I think the smaller or mid-range length seems yeah. more appropriate. Now this is a light cruiser or a fast frigate, and is powered by one fifteen hundred plus Cochrane warp core, which fed two warp nacelles and gave a min maximum speed of warp nine point seven for twelve mm. hours, and a normal cruising speed of warp seven. Cool. And it entered service in 2358, which is actually 12 years before the Intrepid class was launched, um, which is really interesting because I didn't... It's interesting where it's placed on the timeline. Yeah, and the Sabre was actually intended to replace the outdated Orbeth class. I did not know that. Yeah, the Sabre was primarily used in conjunction with the Steamrunner class. You know, these two ships were really complementing each other. You know, small, fast, highly maneuverable, and well armed. So good for any mission, almost. The Sabre was equipped with four Type 10 phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers and carried a complement of 45 completed torpedoes as well as components required to manufacture an additional 15 photon torpedoes of various configurations should the need arise. So just like Voyager then who made dozens more, exactly the same. Yeah, or if you needed one to, you know, find a cloaked Romulan or a cloaked ship of some kind, you can fit it with the gas detecting nozzle thing. I like your Freudian slip there, you said Romulan. It's not as Klingon. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, a well-armed little ship. And I think that was the reason it was featured so prominently in the battle for Sector 001 uh, against the Borg. And in fact, on rewatching the battle, you know, all the different clips, you can see four on the screen at the exact same time, which is pretty cool. Um, and then let's not forget that in the Dominion War, this ship was featured in a lot of the different battles. So, yeah. The overall design was somewhat more compact than other Federation ships, but seemed to be part of Starfleet's new design concept of flatter, sleeker starships, as we see in the Defiant, the Sovereign, and the Prometheus, just to name a few. The ship also had a bridge layout similar to the Defiant design, and that was in fact adopted by many of this new breed of Federation mm -hmm. vessel. Cool. So main engineering was on deck one, with the primary warp core being located on deck two, and the deuterium storage and antimatter storage pods on deck seven. So the antimatter was in fact pumped up to the main intake valves in the warp core, and the Sabre is one of the few ships that actually had the warp core running horizontally across the uh, middle line of the ship. The core can therefore be ejected out of the rear of the ship, which I guess makes it one of the most powerful secret weapons of the uh, <laughs> of the Sabre class. Um, yeah, and it should be noted, however, this information does vary from source to source. You know, there are quite a few different MSDs, uh, and some do show a vertical warp core configuration, but this obviously could be a variant or, or multiple different versions. Yeah, and this configuration is seen later on in the Mark I class upgrade or refit. Um, again, this is just another variation of the ship. And to be honest, all this information, conflicting information, and lots of different information, does make our jobs here at Trek Yards harder, but also satisfying. So, we still love it. Yeah, and it makes sense probably that that Mark One, which is a different design, a little bit later design, might incorporate a lot of these differences. So we can kind of reconcile it that way, I think. Yeah, and this Mark One is certainly an evolution, you know, much sleeker lines and a very cool design. Although, call me old fashioned, but I quite like the classic. I prefer the newer one, personally. But... Which is weird. Usually, I prefer the older equipment, <laughs> TOS and all. Anyway, the Sabre also featured two computer cores, with the primary one occupying space on decks 2 and 3, just to starboard of the bridge module, and the secondary core being located in the mirrored position on the port side. Now, since this is such a small ship and the design was maximized for scientific and tactical usage, it did have limited recreational facilities on board. Uh, these included two hollow suites on deck 5. Now, the hollow suites are, of course, smaller than even standard hollow decks, mm. and as such cannot handle as many of the variables or provide the level of detail that a standard holodeck can. The ship also has a phaser range, gymnasium, hydroponics bay, and an observation lounge, which was located on the forward edge of deck five. So, five forward? High five forward. High five forward. That was tasteless, it was awful, nice. <laughs> Real show now. So the main deflector dish occupies the front sections of decks eight and nine, and can actually be manually moved five degrees in any direction off the Z axis. Hmm. Uh, power for the sensor systems comes from two graviton polarity generators located on deck 10, with the main long-range navigation deflector controls being located immediately behind the deflector on deck 8. So I guess yeah, that's the place Kirk would die in <laughs> if this was the Enterprise B. <laughs> yes. And now it's time for some techno babbles. Let's get to it. Well, since this ship has replaced the older Oberth class of starships, it is basically the newest Federation science vessel. Uh, and some of you may have thought that it was the Nova, but no, the Nova class is the new exploration class, with the Intrepid being the long-term exploration class. Anyways, let's get into a little detail about the sensor systems on board, shall we? So, lateral sensor pallets, or short-range sensors, are located around the rim of the entire ship, providing full coverage in all standard scientific fields, but with the emphasis in the following areas. Astronomical phenomenon, planetary analysis, remote life form analysis, EM scanning, passive neutrino scanning, parametric subspace field stress, which is essentially a scan for, to search for cloaked vessels, thermal variances, and quasi-stellar material. Each sensor pallet, 16 in all, can be interchanged and recalibrated with any other pallet on the ship. And I've got to say, Stuart, Oof. you sound very clever saying all that stuff. And you're a, real, a real scientific mind of you. Techno babble, I love it. Uh, yeah, and the ship also has 18 independent tactical sensors. Each sensor automatically tracks and locks onto incoming hostile vessels and reports the bearing, the aspect, the distance, and the vulnerability percentage to the main tactical sensors, uh, to the main tactical station, sorry, located on the bridge. And each tactical sensor is approximately 80% efficient against ECM, or electronic countermeasures, and can operate fairly well in a particle flux nebula, which has hitherto been impossible. So a nice step forward in terms of Federation technology. 
Good job, yes. guys. <laughs> <laughs> and the ECM that you just mentioned will be very familiar to all of our fans out there that played Starfleet Battles or the Starfleet Command PC games. As you mentioned, it stands for electronic countermeasures, which basically means that it was electrical interference that confused an enemy's sensors and made target lock on a little more difficult. So jamming. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this could, however, be cancelled out with the application of ECCM, which is electronic counter countermeasures. So a very in inventive name. <laughs> uh, which, when the same amount or more power was allocated to your ECCM rating, you could, in fact, return all sensor operations to normal by cancelling out any ECM that your opponent may be using against you. Now, do you get the feeling, Stuart, that ECCM is maybe invented by a Vulcan, that term? Because it's very unimaginative, the name. It's a very logical name. It's very Indeed. logical. It describes exactly what it does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that's a whole episode in and of itself. Uh, well, Vulcans. The general rules of Starfleet oh. battles. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so let's get back to the ship, shall we? There are a total of eight science labs located on deck four. Two of the labs are dedicated biology chemistry labs, capable of also being used for medical purposes should the need arise. The remaining six were multi-purpose facilities and could be adjusted to the needs of the mission profile. Hmm. The botany department maintains a small hydroponics bay on deck five for research purposes. Another very cool fact about this ship is that the chief science officer's office is located directly adjacent to Science Lab 1. So there are two forward-facing shuttle bays located on deck five, with shuttle bay two in fact being larger than two because it holds the maintenance facilities for the shuttles. And once again, however, depending on what source you look at, because there are you know, some conflicting ones uh, based on some schematics, some say there are actually shuttle bays at the rear of the ship. But this could be a variant of, you know, there's so many variants of these ships, they could be anything. Um, and the normal uh, sets of shuttles that this ship would have would be two Type 18 shuttle pods, two Type 6 shuttle crafts to work, bees, which is awesome, and a one Type 10 shuttle craft, so pretty good. Due to this ship's versatility, it could be assigned to any number of mission profiles, including Federation policy and diplomacy, so essentially transporting various diplomatic personnel to different locations, deep space exploration, ongoing scientific investigation, tactical or defensive operations, and emergency search and rescue. Now, each of these mission profiles did require additional mission-specific equipment, such as more labs or increased weapon storage, and the ship was configured and outfitted accordingly. Cool. Uh, the ship has a total of 56 five-person escape pods, and each pod had enough life support and provisions for 90 days in space. Uh, although, while there were no life pods directly attached to the bridge, there are in fact two escape pods located on deck two, which are actually reserved for the top four officers in chain of command. Uh, because, you know, those are the last four to leave the ship. Yeah, and since the Dominion Wars, the number of experienced captains in Starfleet began to dwindle, so the notion of captain going down with the ship had been abolished. If the ship needed to be abandoned... Stuart, you're a TOS captain, so that rule hasn't been invented yet. Continue. If the ship needed to be abandoned, the top four officers would wait until everyone else was safely off the ship and then opt to arm self destruct or not, uh, and then leave in the two main escape pods. So don't worry, everyone's fine in my era. And I'm heroic and go down with the ship. Okay, now let's move on to behind the scenes. Saber was designed by Alex Yeager at ILM, and was one of four new ship designs done for the movie First Contact to flesh out the fleet. The others being the Steamrunner, the Norway, and of course the Akira class. The design direction of these ships was simple. And that was to design ships that did not look like the new Enterprise-E, and thus avoid confusion as to which ships uh, were on screen in the opening battle hmm. scene. I would also like to briefly discuss the MK-1 refit or upgrade that we have found pictures for. I love the look of this version even more than I like the original design. A great progression and advancement that makes the whole thing just look that much more nice looking. Hmm. So Alex Yeager described the design. Uh, I don't recall the actual numbers. I just remember saying it was about the same size as the Enterprise source section. Which is interesting, because which Enterprise do they mean? The E or the D? Because they've got quite different size sources. Good point. I think we should have a visual beside us right now. More work for me. <laughs> yeah, he also recalls the original sketch of the ship actually had these skateboards lined along the secondary hull on either side of the South Eat pennon. But when he modelled it, something changed and he moved these escape pods back to the source section. And it's also worth noting that there's another version of the Sabre with a third nacelle on top called the USS Saratoga. A bit of a doomed name there, but whatever. <laughs> it also had a wider lower hull uh, for the defect dish, and the third cell was actually the was actually the same style as one from the D. So interesting. Uh, the Saber class design was, of course, also seen in Trek gaming, such as Armada Two and Starfleet Command Volume Three, and it's the smallest ship available in Star Trek: Deep Space Nine: Dominion Wars, and also one of the smallest in Star Trek Online, where it has variants named the Rapier and the. Yushan class? Spot on, we'll say. 
In Armada 2, the ship was uh, equipped with pulse phases, and in the player's manual, it actually states that the first prototypes were actually hurried into production to defend against the Borg, and there's a destroyer like the Defiant. But this was a tactical video game, so we'll take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. And it's kind of worth pointing out, I don't know how much Armada 2 you played, but it's like the one of the lowest... Uh, you know, yeah. tier ships. So a lot of those got destroyed in, in an average Federation campaign. <laughs> it's true. It is true. And I did play a lot of Armada too. Still Sorry, do. Sorry Saber Class. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now let's move on to the discussion part of the show. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot I like about this ship. The overall design is very impressive and I love the look of it. Uh, from the front, it looks very similar to the Akira class, but that's the only view that you can really can could confuse somebody. Um, every other angle is very distinctive, and I think the designer did a fantastic job at making the ship look Starfleet, but not look at all Starfleet, if that makes any sense. It's neat to see the new direction that Starfleet took in their approach to designing ships. Smaller, sleeker, and I think more mission-specific is a great way to do things. Unless, of course, you get pulled into the Delta Quadrant aboard a very small ship like this, uh, or even the Nova class. <laughs> uh, that would be awful to be stuck on such a small ship for all that time, I think. Although if it was the Defiant, and if you could build more contra torpedoes, it might not be so bad, uh, apart from the lack of holodecks. And, uh, but this is a tangent, a bad, not useful tangent. <laughs> so back to the Sabre. Yeah, so it's certainly a break from the traditional Star Trek mould. Uh, I think Alex Yeager did a great job in designing something that still fits into Star Trek, and yet pushed the envelope of Trek design to show there was more than just the, you know, the Connie, Saucer and Nacelle look. Uh, and it's a cool little ship. While not one of my favourites, I really like its unique look. Um, I really like the front shuttle bays and the very unique deflector dish. Uh, it's a weird one, but it's still welcome in the Trek family. So, uh, I always hate this part of the show when it's a ship I like, anyways. Um, something I don't like. Hmm. Well, there is the side view, which honestly looks more alien. Or dare I say, Maquis in appearance. Shocking. No, no. no. How I feel about the Maquis aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a great fan of that, yeah. but even that view has a great streamlined look to it. Um, just not specifically Federation, I think. But aside from that, I really don't have much that I don't like. So, hmm. case closed. Moving along. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, the side look does look very strange, and I think if you just take that perspective, it really gives it a far more aggressive feel than any of the other angles, which really isn't necessarily the feel of the ship. So, strange one there. Uh, if I had to pick one thing, I mean, given the size of the ship, I think the secondary hull is very small. I mean, it's a small ship, and I just don't know how much stuff and, 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 and science kit you can fit into such a small ship. So that's probably my only thing. Not enough room. That's it, really. <laughs> okay, folks, that's it for another Trek Yards episode. Hope we did you proud with this fan-requested episode, Aaron. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts and input on it. Yeah. As for everyone else out there, we do know that there are ships that are constantly being requested by all of you, most of which we do have in the lineup for future episodes, so please be patient and we will get to them when we can. Or request it for a mission briefing on our Facebook page or in the comments below and we will do it much sooner in our new free flow type format. Otherwise, if you do want to see another specific ship done like this episode was, please email either myself or Samuel at trekyards at hotmail.com and ask away. We will get in touch with you about how much we feel we would need donation-wise as per your request. We love doing these types of fan-requested episodes, but it does take a lot of time and hard work, so we would need a donation of some small amount, which any of you can do by going to our Trek Yards page at trekyards.com and clicking the Donate button. Even if you just want to throw us $5 as a thank you for entertaining you all, it would be very much appreciated. And of course, all that will go back towards new equipment, convention appearances, and other improvements to Trek Yards. Yeah. Okay, guys, we need to beam on out of here, so click the like button, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and we will see you all next week. Same track time, same track station. Bye, guys. Bye.